Welcome back to the Haunted Heart Podcast, folks. How are you? We're here with you today, sitting down in our comfy chairs in our podcast studio, here to bring you that delicious spookiness that you love. I love how we keep saying podcast studio as though it's going to transform the space into something other than a bedroom. Listen, aren't like, you uh, an agent of that? What do you call it? Chaos, chaos magic? Chaos magic. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going Absolutely. to call it a, a podcast studio until it becomes one. It is whatever I mean, we call it. So far, I mean, it seems to be working well. Who it's knows? That's true. But you're here. We're here. My name is Kenny, and I'm sitting here with Katie. Absolutely. And we're going to tell be you a story okay. today. That's her. She's over there. That's, That's her right. right over there. She's sitting across from me, um, across the table. And, you know, on our table here, we've got a bunch of things. We've got our uh, beautiful, like, recording equipment that's blinking and letting us know when Did we're you forget not... the name of the mixer? <laughs> it's a folk. I, no, I mean, I don't really know. It's, it's a Scarlet. It's a Scarlet. It's soundboard. <laughs> it's, it's a box that lets us know when we're being too loud. It's true. We've got it's our candles here. That. I've got an empty glass that used to have a delicious, a cocktail. delicious cocktail in it but i have consumed it all yeah and we're here with you yeah i'm I'm glad we said that like we had any other place to be right now <laughs> true, true. <laughs> but we have some new folks to welcome to the fam today yeah some new folks that are gonna sit with us at our table tonight while we record absolutely That's some souls exciting. to welcome to the podcasting table tonight Shep shows to bring to the fold. I know you love welcoming new souls, Kenny, so I will let you take the lead this evening. I believe we have three souls. We do, actually. We have three A souls. Wealth of souls. All from uh, different tiers. That's of true. Our, uh, Patreon family. Family, yes, exactly. So I'm going to start us out with our first from the Haunted Heart Tarot. We welcome Ashton W. And now, from the Stay Spooky Squad, Jennifer L. And last but not least, hailing from the delicious cannibal cult, is Carlos Welcome, welcome, Darklings. Your candles are lit. They are dressed with good intentions for health, wealth, and happiness, and they stand proudly beside our mics to light our way through this episode. If you're interested in becoming a Patreon person and supporting the uh, show, you can find us at patreon.com slash thehauntedheart. And as you've seen this evening, there are plenty of tiers for one and all to join. Absolutely, folks. And it means so much to us when you decide to help out the show. We couldn't do it without you. You are, like we've said before, you are the lifeblood to this show. You are the entity for which we sacrifice our souls for. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Just together, they are legion. Yeah, they can blame it on you. Um <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You are going no. to be interviewed by the police. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I have a treat for us. You know you how when we, we, when we tell people that we, you know, love when they just applaud us and mm. <laughs> and just give us all of these like accolades and like all of this. We oh, love do we that. say that? Do we? we? Okay. No. okay. I am a Leo and I am not ashamed mm. for that. And I will never be. I am a Virgo and I am judging you. <laughs> so... Here's That's that. fine. That's perfectly fine. We do. So I wanted to read this wonderful note that was left to us by C.C. Kernan that 
says, equal parts spooky, engaging, and funny. This is honestly one of the best podcasts I've encountered in a while, and I'm so glad I stumbled upon it. I love the hosts and the delightfully chaotic energy they bring. (laughs) Seriously worth the listen. I appreciate that nod to the chaotic energy. It's true. It is true. (laughs) I would consider us a chaotic good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's true. You're questioning? <laughs> no, I'm just an edge lord who loves to characterize myself as chaotic neutral. But to be honest, we're definitely a chaotic good. Like I would, we're, I would say chaotic good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But thank you for that. We always appreciate a wonderful review. We love to read them on the air. So if you love listening to us and you know want to share some love, it's a great free way to do it. We um, always appreciate that. It's a great way to help the show out. And it doesn't cost anything. And it doesn't anything. cost anything. And it really helps us in the algorithm. And it helps us kind of reach new people, which is really cool. So, so drop us a review on uh, Apple Podcast. I just don't know how the Apple Podcast al- algorithm works. Algorithm. Yeah. Um, algorithm. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage. <laughs> Mr. Algorithm. <laughs> algorithm i love that that's a great drag name what a moment um no any any review that you can leave us on stitcher spotify apple podcast wherever you're listening to this or even facebook like you can yeah you got that too too, so i i i enabled that feature that's true (laughs) i i did uh (laughs) i think i did it after the first two years Mm -hmm. i was doing the show when we realized that it existed Uh all right are we done hawking ourselves to these people i don't know are we here to provide content I don't have any content today. And fresh out. <laughs> I, I'm just fresh out of content. Most people are fresh out of fucks. I'm fresh out of content. I don't have any. I've used it all up. So I really hope that you have brought something to this table today besides these wonderful dress candles. Well, luckily I have. Great. Well, I'm sitting in my comfortable chair. I kind of I, I kind of have to pee a little bit. So uh, that makes two. I'm less. a little, I might be a little antsy. So we're going to make it. It may, it may be for some great content. Who knows? <laughs> All right. So I had this, like, I had this beautiful, like, just to let you guys know, uh, we, we sort of, we don't script episodes, but we sort of do have like a rough outline just to make sure that we're not like all fucking over the place, like episodes one through 100. Um, <laughs> So we we do kind of write like a rough outline. And I had this lovely little intro planned for you. And then uh, last week, Kenny came in and did an episode on the Mayans in Mexico. And it kind of fucked up my whole intro. Did it really? <laughs> yes, because I was going to come in and let you know, honey, we ain't been traveling very much. We ain't been going too many places. We've been homebodies lately. But I was going to take you on a trip. And I was going to load you up and tell you to pack your sunscreen and your Dramamine because I'm taking you to Mexico. Oh, but we didn't already been there. <laughs> did you really? We didn't already. But. This time you took us in the way way back machine. I took us in the time machine, yes. Right. To the to the Mayans and and we explored the lovely Red Queen. Uh may she rest in peace. <laughs> rest in royalty. Absolutely. But I'm gonna take us to more modern Mexico City. Mod. We love it. More modern. Specifically like Mexico City of like the nineties and like early to mid two thousands. Okay. That's where we're going. Damn, we were very similar in our topics almost. Yes, we were. We hit that location. And we didn't were, plan it. We were, uh, what did they say, simpatico? It was simpatico. There you go. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, no. Um, no, but we we try to talk to each other as little as possible when we're prepping episodes about what we're going to cover. And it was just complete coincidence and chaos that we both uh, picked topics in that region of the world. So I thought that was kind of cool. Interesting. Anyway. Now that my intro is shot as hell. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean for it to be. One thing we haven't uh, visited in a while is true crime. See, you say that, but you always, I don't know if it's just the fact that, you know, my mind is just so scarred from a lot of your, you know, true crime topics that it just, that always feels fresh to me. (laughs) You feel like it's right around the corner. It always just, I don't know, you say that, it just, but it always feels fresh to me. I don't know why. It's been a while. It's been a while. Uh, So I have a case for you this week. You know, we're due for a pretty dark one. And today's topic is definitely that. Okay. This week, we are discussing the case of Juana Barraza, or as she was known in Mexico City, La Mata Viejitas, the little old lady killer. Ooh. 
Okay. Now, before we go any further, I want to acknowledge that a lot of my research on this case was pulled from Susana Vargas Cervantes' book, The Little Old Lady Killer. As Mexico's most prolific female serial killer ever charged, tried, and sentenced, there are quite a few sources on Barraza, but in my opinion, Susana Vargas Cervantes does a great job on separating the case itself from the public's cultural perception of Barraza, which is important, and you'll understand what I mean by that as we go along. So thank you, Susana, for your significant contribution to the body of knowledge surrounding this case. Yes. And for this episode today, we give you a little mini applause here, as loud as we can <laughs> get for the, for the mics. Yes. So let's get into it. Juana Barraza was born in 1958 in Ipazayucan, Hidalgo, a poverty-stricken rural area north of Mexico City. It's a pretty small town with a population of only about 11,500 people in 2005. Barraza's father, Trinidad Barraza, and her mother, Justa Samperio, had a troubled relationship. Just three months after Juana was born, her mother abandoned her husband to go live with her boyfriend, Refugio Semperio, who also happened to be used as own stepfather in addition to her boyfriend. Juana Braza was no stranger to trauma. Her childhood was reportedly full of it. As a child, she never learned to read or write beyond her own name and had an extremely rocky relationship with her mother, whom she barely spoke to. At the age of 12, Barraza's mother reportedly pimped her out for the first time to a man named Jose Lugo in exchange for three beers. Mm. Literally three beers. How fucking disgusting. Yeah, her mom's not the best by I, I a long I shot. I wouldn't I would, I would say so. I mean, I think when you make the decision to leave your husband, no shade. But if you leave your husband for your own stepfather, I think there's a lot of choices there that we're making. None of which are good. Yeah, that doesn't, doesn't seem very healthy, I would say. Yeah. Lugo would abuse Barraza for four years, impregnating her twice when she was 13 and 16 years old. Both of those pregnancies resulted in miscarriages. While the details of the abuse differ from account to account, there seems little doubt that Barraza harbored deep resentment towards her mother for letting the abuse happen. After her mother died of cirrhosis, Barraza finally left for Mexico City. In Mexico City, she went on to have several failed marriages in which she had four children of her own. Barraza's eldest son would later die of injuries sustained in a mugging at age 24. In the 1980s and 1990s, Barraza held a variety of jobs and even toured central Mexico as an amateur masked wrestler in the Lucha Libre tradition. The name she chose for herself, La Dama del Silencio, the Lady of Silence, was reportedly a reference to Barraza's own shy, silent personality. By all reports, Barraza loved the Lucha Libre lifestyle, the performance of power and spectacle. Now, Lucha Libre typically involves titanic battles between fighters with cartoon character names and costumes who are either identified as technicos, good guys who fight by the rules, and rudos, villains who break them. In an interview with a major national television channel at a wrestling event just a few weeks before her arrest, Barraza described herself as, quote, rudo to the core. She was often seen in the front rows of established arenas and also organized wrestling events for small town fiestas and even fought in the ring herself on many occasions. Her costume was actually pretty reminiscent of the Pink Power Ranger. I love that. Looks very similar to the Pink Power Ranger. Definitely took some inspiration there, I think. And the mask that she wore was in the shape of a butterfly. I love that. I love that. I didn't realize that that was, uh, like, I thought it was just mostly men that, that no. did that. So it is typically, like, Lucha Libre and Machismo are kind of, we've talked about Machismo on the, sh on the show before. They're kind of intertwined. Oh, but okay. um, but she there there are female lucha libre uh, fighters, but they are more rare, much more rare. But I, I love that though. I love the the name. The mm -hmm. name is where it's at. I mean, Pink Power Ranger. Like, I feel like we all related to a Power Ranger at, at some point. The suit is child. iconic. The suit is iconic. Pink Power Ranger. Uh, I liked the um, I like the black the black Power Ranger. Of course. Yes. <laughs> 
I think pink Power Ranger was my favorite. It was either pink or yellow or my two. Like, it was one or the other. I think it was pink Power Ranger. The red was always, like, anytime you have... Uh, it was too much. It, anytime you always have, like, a group of people or something and it's, like, they're color coordinated, right? Like, the red is always typically, like, your main straight guy fucking bossy bitch (laughs) right like he's typically very much that right and then you know you have your pink for your girls and then i don't know so there was i always liked like the also like the black power ranger the green one Mm -hmm. those were always the ones that i was like because they weren't the main ones Mm. you hate a leader is what i'm hearing I hate any other hate leader. Authority. <laughs> <laughs> I hate authority. Yes, yes that's what Absolutely. It is. I have authority issues. So through the 1980s and 1990s, we're sort of like Juana Barraza is sort of finding herself in this Lucha Libre tradition. And it, it really is probably when looking at her entire life, it's probably the happiest period is this period when she's involved with this thing, because it really it really seems to have spoken to her. You know, they're going to say that about us one day. It's true. They were just doing they're going to be some podcasters later on who the do height. a report on us. And they're like, you know, when they were starting this podcast, I mean, this was the happiest moments of their life <laughs> before they went off the edge and just fucking killed everyone. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the future. No, I'm kidding. So, yeah. So so through the 80s and the early 90s, you know, it's it's sort of good vibes. But in 1995, things kind of started to change. Short on cash after the birth of her fourth child, Baraza had to find some other way to supplement her income um, because she was sort of like eight, not aging out of Lucha Libre, but she was less, less and less able to do it. And again, she was sort of in the amateur, like semi, semi pro amateur type field. So she wasn't making like big bucks. Like some of the people who were like way up there in Lucha Libre make a ton of money because it's really popular Mm -hmm. even to this day. But Baraza sort of wasn't at that level. And so she started stealing items from shops and later evolved to burglarizing homes. In 1996, she hatched a plan with a friend, Araceli Tapia Martinez, to steal from the elderly. The two dressed in plain white clothes and pretended to be social services nurses in order to gain access to the homes of elderly folks who were living alone. Once inside, the pair would rob the elderly victims and make off with anything of value they could find within the house. Barraza seems to have continued to support her family through a mixture of domestic work, street vending, and this kind of petty theft for several years. Neighbors in her otherwise largely middle-class area described Barraza's children as friendly and their mother as, quote, always pleasant in passing. Always pleasant in passing. Right. So it seems everybody was none the wiser, right? I mean, that's what it sounds like. Yeah. I feel like that's what they say about me. It's pleasant in passing. In passing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm More never, pleasant I'm once I passed him. <laughs> never pleasant in passing. <laughs> it's quite the opposite, actually. Right. So what Barraza didn't know was that her friend, Araceli Martinez, was also in a relationship with a corrupt federale, Moses Flores Dominguez. And the two of them had concocted a parallel extortion plan against Juana Barraza. What is that? What is Sorry, a federale? What is that? Is it like police? A federale is a is a federal police officer. Uh, so think fed. like, yeah, yeah. There's it, He wasn't like a local, local yokel. He was a federale. And they're sort of, unfortunately, known to be corrupt, corrupt. Like, like corruption. Not not that every federale is corrupt, but. Corruption they're plotting is against deal. this. We're plotting against our, our main character. Here. Yeah. So her friend who is out here hitting up houses, robbing with her and her man is now concocting a whole separate plan to like extort from her friend. See, that's her and her man are going to extort mm-mm. from her friend. Mm-mm. You can't trust a hoe. Mm-mm. That's terrible. <laughs> you really can't. Um, that's can't. Mm-mm. I would never do that to you. I wouldn't do that to you either. I Absolutely that's how you not. Know, no. Right or not. No, 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 no. We wouldn't <laughs> do that. Absolutely not. I feel like we could probably get someone like I would have my mission. You would have your mission. Mm-hmm. We'd have someone that we together would use as like a scapegoat. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Um, and this would be a person that would be deserving of such a title. Uh. Right. So. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. We'd, we'd give back. Okay. Right. Robin Hood <laughs> and all that. 
So Moses, this corrupt federale, met Baraza after a burglary that she had committed alone and demanded 12,000 pesos in return for not arresting her. So he's like extorting money from her, which is making things much more difficult. Yeah. So obviously the whole extortion thing put a real damper on the friendship and on the revenue stream that Baraza was getting from committing robberies with her former friend. To make matters worse, in 2000, Baraza had to retire from wrestling, where she had previously been earning 300 to 500 pesos per fight. So it wasn't a ton of money, but it wasn't chump change, and it was helping pay the bills. So obviously, in light of these things, Baraza's situation quickly became rather desperate. So her friend and her friend's boyfriend were extorting money from her, so mm-hmm. that way that this other, that they, as a couple, mm-hmm. would get more money. Yeah. Yeah. Was she aware of that? She wasn't aware of it, right? Oh, Did no, she, she kn- was because he, oh. he straight up said, I'm going to I'm I'm a police officer and I'm going to arrest you or I'm going to, you know, bring to light that you've been robbing people. What if I just fucking bring to light that you're a corrupt ass cop? How about that? <laughs> Unfortunately, how about I fucking Lucho Libre your ass uh, fucking right? I mean, I don't know. I'd be concerned if I was him. Like, you don't want to be messing with. Look, you she's know, a tough lady. She fucking she looks pretty tough. power slam your fucking ass into the next fucking uh, you know century. Who it's knows? Capable. We'll call it. Capable. I feel like I wouldn't yeah. put on that fucking butterfly mask, and you'll see that in the middle of the night when you're fucking <laughs> getting up to take a piss. It is pretty terrifying. <laughs> um, yeah. So it it's you know I mean they are committing crimes. So they're they're robbing people. They're breaking into people's houses. So there's that. that. <laughs> I do have to but, remember that. But also, he's a dick too. He's like a dick squared, right? Um, he because yeah. he he knows that they're doing that, and then he's gonna like turn around and extort her and be like, "Oh well, I'm gonna tell on you." But like your girlfriend is doing the same thing and was doing it with her. I have to I have to remember that that they were stealing from people. Yeah. So like, mm, it's kind of you enter that realm of like, is there honor in dishonor? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So basically the heat is being turned up gradually and gradually until we get um, we kind of get to a boiling point here. So Baraza's first victim was Maria de la Luz Gonzalez Anaya, age 64, who was killed on November 25th, 2002. Like in the robberies she'd committed before, Baraza posed as a public health services nurse, all dressed in white, to gain access to Gonzalez's home. Once inside her apartment, though, Gonzalez reportedly made some comments that Baraza considered derogatory. Totally understandable when one is literally being robbed. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think manners just kind of go out the door when you're being robbed. Like, right, right. I'm not going to. You know, understandable. I, yeah, I mean, you fucking, you're robbing her. You're a burglar. But apparently, Baraza didn't think so. Infuriated by the woman's comments, Baraza beat the woman before fatally strangling her with her bare hands. Shit. For three months after the Gonzalez murder, Baraza laid low and no further murders were committed. However, on March 2nd, 2003, she robbed and strangled Guillermina Leon Oropesa, age 84, following the same modus operandi. From that point on, Baraza would continue to kill every few months, racking up a reported death toll of between 24 to 49 deaths, all told. Fuck. And they were all little old ladies. Oh, my God. That's like fucking floodgates open shit. Yeah. Jesus. So this is sort of where, you know, it's it's always difficult when covering a case, particularly one like like this one, um, you, we don't want to make these people sympathetic characters. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I do think that there's value in when we look at these cases, analyzing, like, where did this come from? Things don't happen in a vacuum. And, you know, even even horrible, horrific murders like this don't happen devoid of attachment to anything else in life. If you look at Juana Barraza's early life, there were clearly a lot of things there that sort of contributed to this simmering rage. And then once she let the lid off once, it's like there was no getting the lid back on the jar. And it was just a an endless stream of rage. Right. I think it's important to understand that you have to look at the whole story, right? Like, And a part of that is the history of 
what led up to a certain point. And you can do that without being sympathetic. Right. But, I mean, you kind of have to have the whole story to understand what it is that led up to that point. Right. So while we're not... And you're not excusing any behaviors. You know, you... I mean, you still have to understand what could have possibly been in someone's mind in order to commit the things that they do. Right. So we're definitely not excusing the behavior, but what we're doing is putting it in its own context. You know, it didn't happen out of the blue. So Baraza continued to approach her victims on the street or she would knock on their doors, pretending to be a city council nurse or a social worker. Later on, she upgraded her old plain white clothes to an actual nurse's uniform in order to make herself look more official. She would offer massages or help in obtaining medicines and subsidies. Once inside the house, if her victims were distracted, she would strangle them immediately. If not, she would beat them first using moves learned in her wrestling career. So she carried a bag with medical tools, quote unquote, as part of her disguise, but Aza usually strangled her victims with her bare hands or with a ligature taken often from the victim's own home, objects such as phone cables or pantyhose, which she would then leave at the crime scene. If none of those items were to be found, however, Baraza would use the stethoscope she carried with her to strangle her victims. She would then rob the house, mostly for her own gain. But interestingly, a search of her home later revealed that she would also keep some of her victims' items as trophies, along with newspaper clippings reporting the various murders, which is an interesting detail considering Baraza's illiteracy. So in mid-2005, Baraza began a relationship with a taxi driver, Jose Francisco Torres Herrera. His alias was actually, and this is kind of funny, his alias was El Friol, which is the bean. I was saying that's beans, <laughs> El, El Friol, Frioles. I was like, beans, the bean. I know that. The bean's going to get you where you need to go. The taxi bean. <laughs> I mean, that's the cab company for me. Yeah. Call it fucking Uber. We're going to call up a bean. I mean, that is a hell of a taxi fare, though, (laughs) to be hauling people back and forth to to crime scenes. Uh, Yeah. Um, I mean, does the rate go up for that? I don't know. Is that a surge? So So this El Frio guy becomes her accomplice. Mr. Bean. He, oh God. Of. And now it's Rowan Atkinson <laughs> in my mind. Just like That's driving a taxi could. in between <sighs> these horrific, brutal murders. That's all I could think of is Mr. Bean. Yes. So the taxi driver who was not Mr. Bean becomes her accomplice um, and her lover. And as a result of this new relationship, her attacks increased in range and frequency. And the times at which the murders occurred changed from daytime to nighttime. The killing of 82-year-old Carmen Camila Gonzalez Miguel on September 28, 2005, an upper-class woman and the mother of prominent Mexican criminologist Luis Rafael Moreno Gonzalez, spurred the police into launching a special operation under the name Operación Parques en Jardines, Operations Parks and Gardens. Got it. So um, these these murders are happening and there's sort of a rash of like these these little old ladies, people's grandmas being killed. And the police are sort of like aware of it, but also kind of there's a whole lot that was going on behind the scenes with like the political climate in Mexico City. And I didn't want to like bog us down into all of that, but it does sort of have an effect on this case in that there the the person who was sort of running for elected office at that time, there was a contingent of people who wanted that person to be voted out. And they were saying like under this guy, like things have been so much more violent in Mexico city. And so that contingent of people who were largely influential in the police force were not really interested in solving these rashes of little old lady murders because it was contributing to the fact that the public perception of this guy who was supposed to be in charge of police was that things were so much more violent under him. Right. So they were kind of just like, oh, we'll get around to solving those eventually, but not under this guy because we don't want him to have the credit. <laughs> so they sort of like are backburnering the, the fact that all these little old ladies are turning up strangled and they're very obviously not dying of natural causes. But when this prominent Mexican criminologist's mother is murdered, that sort of sets things moving with the police. She got the wrong one. Yeah. 
So under the Operation Parks and Gardens, officer patrols in the areas where the killer was active increased. Pamphlets advising the elderly to be wary of strangers were distributed, along with new sketches based on eyewitness testimony. And the police even paid elderly women to act as bait in park areas to try to catch this person. In a move that was heavily criticized, police also announced that they were looking for a homosexual man, quote, transvestite or transgendered. And they later... For what? Right. They later arrested 49 transvestite prostitutes who were all released when their prints didn't match those collected from the crime scenes. So this is a huge thing in this case. The the police also requested collaboration from the French police under the belief that their killer was similar to the homosexual serial killer uh, Terry Paulin, if you know that case, the monster of Montmartre. But basically... You had these eyewitnesses who would see somebody fleeing a house or a little old lady turns up murdered in her home and eyewitnesses say, well, you know, I saw somebody who doesn't live on this street or she doesn't live in this area. And it was a woman wearing a wig. And over and over, these eyewitnesses would say it was a woman wearing a wig. And the police, despite those testimonies, were saying, you know, well, we must be looking for a homosexual man. Well, we must be looking for a crossdresser. Well, we must, you know, we must be looking for a transgendered person. I'm gonna um, tell you why. No, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you why you wouldn't be doing that for me because you wouldn't be able to clock that wig from far away. <laughs> if, if that was the case, right. yes. if that was the case, you would not be able to clock that. That yes, was a wig get you a nice from across the front. street. No, 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 no. That's mm-hmm. how that would tip me off immediately. That I would know that that would be not the case. Oh, you clocked that it was a wig. Okay, no, right, right. That's not who we're looking for. Right. Just saying. So. Yeah, they had this like mountain of evidence and the eyewitnesses were saying, you know, we we saw a woman. I saw a woman. And it was just unfathomable to police that their suspect could be female. And I think part of that, you know, there's a lot of different reasons, but I think part of that is that machismo mindset of, well, you know, clearly people are being strangled. It must be a man. Right. Despite the fact that the evidence was showing this is female. So around midday, On January 25th, 2006, Barraza approached the home of Ana Maria de los Reyes, age 84. To gain entry to Reyes' home, Barraza reportedly asked for a glass of water. Inside the house, what should she find lying on the living room table but a stethoscope? Picking it up, she approached Reyes from behind, using the healthcare device to strangle her hostess until her body fell limp. After looting the home, Barraza hurried out of the house, but as it just so happens, a tenant who was living in Reyes' home at the time was returning home as Barraza was leaving the scene. Upon entering the house, the tenant found his landlady lying in the floor. He immediately ran out of the house and began chasing the woman in the nurse's uniform that he'd seen leaving the house. Two police happened to be in the area, probably because of the increased police presence under Operation Parks and Gardens, and they joined in the chase. When they apprehended the runner, they realized they'd caught La Mata Viejitas, the little old lady killer. In the weeks and months that followed her capture by the police, Barraza was made to pose next to a bust and police's eyewitness sketches of the suspect, which bore some slight resemblance to Barraza herself. They put this on the news so that everybody could see it. The police also released snaps of Barraza recreating the murder of Reyes for detectives during questioning, along with videoed excerpts of her initial police interrogation. The goal of all of this was to mislead the public into thinking that the police had been on the right track all along in their pursuit of the killer. In reality, though, police had been extremely blinded by their own refusal to believe such horrific crimes could be committed by a woman. They spent years rounding up male suspects, transvestites, and transgendered individuals, all while Barraza's death toll continued to mount. Incredibly, prior to her arrest, Barraza had been previously at a police station on another matter— and was even interviewed on a TV program about wrestling just one week before her arrest, all without a rising suspicion. Shit, so she was on TV. She was still doing this little wrestling gig. Yep. 
Well, she wasn't still doing the wrestling gig, but she was still involved in the Lucha Libre scene. She was still around. Right. Well, I mean, and that was a national interviews. TV channel that they were interviewing her about the importance of Lucha Libre. So um, police were kind of trying to. And it was really interesting. Like the minute that she was arrested before the trial had even taken place, the police just start like releasing all of this information. They released her interviews with the police and her acting out the, you know, the murder, how it happened. And. They, they dumped all of this into the media. And then, of course, the media is happy to have it, as they always are. Yeah. And they start circulating it. And it's before the woman's even been put on trial, which, you know, I think that even in the most horrific of circumstances, people are due a free trial and they are supposed to have that. Um, even in Mexico, they're supposed to have that. It's a it's a principle. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't it very often does not happen that way. And the police obviously had their own interest to protect. So in 2008, Barraza was tried for 30 murders and was found guilty of 16 of them. She was also found guilty of 12 robberies as well. The convictions were mostly for murders that she could be tied to through fingerprint evidence, because as we talked about before, she would often leave the um, implement that she had used to strangle her victims at the scene. So they were able to use fingerprint evidence to tie her to certain cases. Yeah, I was wondering about that. You would think that there would be some sort of way that evidence or something that would have been able to t- help tie this to right. a female figure. You know what I mean? Whether it be like footprints or like, I don't know, something yeah. hair. I mean, yeah. it just seems like she wasn't super careful about, Mm-mm. you know, what she was doing at the scene. So it it just seems like, especially if you were being hands on with someone mm-hmm. in that manner, that there would have been. I'm just surprised that it took them that long and it took this amount of bodies to pile up for them to come to this conclusion, which they only came to because it just so happened that the last person that she literally caught her in the act caught was caught in the act. She was caught in the act. Right. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, you know, like you said, the media explodes. And then all of a sudden they have all of this information that they're dumping to the, through the media. That's kind of like, yep. See, this is everything that we have. It just kind of seems like they just, it's like, oh, look what all we have right now. Yeah. Like, here's all of this yeah. that we have just now collected. And then it's like, oh, well, why didn't Cool, but it's been before? years of, like, people's <laughs> right. grandmothers, yeah. Right, like, yeah, why wasn't any of this released beforehand? Yeah. So, while tried for 30 murders, Barraza herself only confessed to one of the murders, and that was that of Ana Maria de las Reyes, the one that she was caught at. In court, she showed little emotion as she heard the verdict, She said, quote, may God forgive you and not forget me. So many have speculated that the rage that fueled Barraza's murders of society's most vulnerable may have been misplaced and undressed anger at her mother's treatment of her during childhood. Miguel Antiveros, the main criminologist associated with the case, believes Barraza was so damaged by her experiences in childhood that she ended up targeting old ladies because she identified them with her mother. When asked to reveal her motives for the murders, Barraza said simply, I got angry. Barraza was later sentenced to 759 years in prison for her crimes, the longest prison sentence ever bestowed on any convicted murderer in Mexico City. But while many consider that justice well served, others, including Susana Vargas Cervantes, who wrote The Little Old Lady Killer, point out that justice in this case may not be so cut and dry. Often in court cases involving female killers, we see significantly shorter and less severe sentences being handed down to female killers versus male killers. But in this case, it actually seems the opposite is true. While Barraza's heinous crimes obviously call for imprisonment, Susana Vargas Cervantes has argued that it seems Barraza's extreme sentence may be less of a product of her actual crimes and more of a product of her optics and self-expression. With her more masculine facial features, close-cropped hair, obvious physical strength, and butch wardrobe, Juana Barraza embodies the antithesis of machismo culture. It is possible that Juana Barraza is being punished or stigmatized for what she is, not what she has done. Regardless of whatever else she may have been, Juana Barraza was a murderer. She snuffed out the lives of possibly up to 49 of society's most vulnerable individuals, our elders, making her one of the most prolific female serial killers to date. 
Instead of respect, aid, and deference, she brought violence into their homes for the promise of a few objects of value and what I believe was of far more importance to Baraza, a brief, fleeting feeling of power and control, two things that were vastly lacking from much of the rest of her life. And that is the story of La Mata Viejitas, the old lady killer. Yeah, it's interesting. I I feel like when you are talking about a specific profile of victim, and specifically when it comes to the elderly, I feel like that that is a lot of people, you know, see them as easy targets, right? Mm. And I just feel like, I don't know, I feel like that that might have been the case for her is that she felt like they were easy targets and it was an easy way for her to feel that, you know, brief moment of power, whatever it is that she was doing. And they're usually the ones that I I feel like could be a little more trusting. Like, you know, she, she went into these people's homes under the guise of a nurse or whatnot. And so I think she definitely took advantage of that vulnerability and, I find it hard. I definitely like, I find it hard. Not that we should sympathize with her, but like, I just, I just think that she definitely took advantage of, of Mm -hmm. an extremely vulnerable population. And Mm -hmm. it's just, it's kind of leaves like a sickening feeling in, in the pit of my stomach. Like, I mean that, that you would kill anybody, of course, but specifically the fact that it was, if it was for some sort of like rush of power and then she just sort of like, targeted the easiest population that she thought would help her feel that just like is uh, makes me really sick to my stomach. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it started as what you're saying. I think it started as, you know, I need money. I need a way to support myself and to support these kids. And, you know, being straight laced is like not cutting it for me. So, you know, we'll just, you know, it started, it's kind of a slippery slope. It started with her friend and, you know, oh, well, you know, these old people have all these assets and like they have all this stuff and they don't need it anyway. And they're just, you know, living by themselves and 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 hoarding all this wealth or hoarding all this whatever for themselves. And they don't need that. So we're going to take some of it. Right. And so she starts like robbing these people who are vulnerable, as you said. And then it's, I think it sort of escalated. I think those those early robberies with her friend sort of showed her that feeling of power. It it, it gave her a taste of, you know, this is what it feels like when Juan is in charge. This is what it feels like when I come into this space and I'm the one who's calling the shots. And I think that did connect with that feeling of not being in control from childhood. I do think that that in a lot of ways this was connected to to her mother because if we think about it her mother had died of cirrhosis of the liver before she even moved to Mexico City had her mother lived her mother would have been about the age of the women that she was killing and i think somehow that you know all of that got rolled into a ball of you know these people have all of this stuff and they don't need it so i'm going to take some of it for myself and then we got into you know all of the things that her mother had done to violate her. And that just sort of got transposed onto her victims. And then at that point, you know, at that point, it's like, well, did that just sort of happen and evolve? Or was that a justification for then killing these people? What Was that used as justification of, well, you know, they're just like her and therefore they deserve to die? It's really tricky. Well, it's hard to, to to say what's going on in someone's mind at that point, yeah. right? Well, and two, a lot of what we, a lot of you know the criminologists that have worked on the case, and that that has kind of been their opinion. But we're basing this off of testimony that she gave once she was in custody. And there's a lot of things that people say. You know, we see it all the time with serial killers. There's serial killers who claim, you know, all of these murders were them, so that they can gain that infamy. And then it turns out that two thirds of them aren't. You know. Um, right. You see the same thing with Henry Lee Lucas. You know, he claimed a shitload of murders and the feds were always pulling him out of prison to go places and they would give him fucking milkshakes for in exchange for confessing to murders that that man didn't ever commit. I mean, he certainly committed plenty, but he confessed to far more. And once you're sort of 
once they're sort of taken into prison and then the media gives them like a platform to discuss, you know, well, what's everything about your life and what's all your traumas and why did you do this and what drove you to this? You know, it, it can be, I always sort of take that stuff with a grain of salt because it's like, at that point, it's Juana Barraza telling the story and Juana Barraza is the same person who has carried out all these crimes. So of course she's going to be looking for sympathy. Right. I mean, so, so she's going to tell the story in the way that's most sympathetic to her. From her point of view. Right. right? So, so that's why I kind of call into question, like I'm sure her mother was an element there, but was it something that she was not in control of and a link that was made in her mind and this, this whole thing? Or was it a very conscious decision to say, these women are going to pay for what my mother did? And that's going to give me the justification to rob and steal. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really know which way. Like, I definitely can, I, I can see it that way, but I don't know. I'm just getting, personally for me, I'm just getting that it was just, uh, that they were easy targets. Yeah. I, 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 I just, I, I get that, and I understand that, when, you know, that other perspective that, like, this was fueled, you know, by rage, and then you see it, and I understand that, but it just, um, I don't know. There's an element to me that just kind of still makes me lean more towards that these were just easy targets for her. Yeah. And I just I don't know, I can't shake that. Yeah. That these were just easy targets for this woman. And I don't cuz I mean and then at some point you have to just think that like okay, once you I mean you have all these bodies or you know that are piling up like eventually she didn't seem to be doing anything to really cover herself or cover her tracks, right? Yeah, very So is there, and you always have to call this into question, does it become uh, a point to where you're kind of wanting to be captured, right? Like you just become so reckless. Like at some point these bodies are are, are piling up that you have to be caught eventually, right? And do you just reach such a state of like apathy that you just don't really care anymore? I don't don't know if it's apathy or if it's just extreme confidence because she was sloppy from the very beginning. You know what I mean? And she got away with it. You know, ligatures were left at the scene. There wasn't an effort to like clean up because she was looting as much as she could and then getting the hell out of there. So, you know, it estimates range from 24 to 49 people that were murdered by this, this person. And after 48 murders, where you weren't caught, why would 49 be any different? You know what I mean? From, from the killer's perspective, it, yeah. you know, they, they weren't caught on the previous 48. So why would 49 be an issue? It's, I think it's a, it's like a confidence thing. They've just gotten overconfident. Ted Bundy actually talked about that. He said, you know, the first time that you commit a murder, you're like crossing all your T's and dotting all your I's and going over everything in your head. And then, you know, the 15th, you forget where you put the wrench. So I think there is an opportunistic element of it, but the, the, the trophy room in her house, when her apartment was surged, the trophy room really gave me pause because I, I think there's a lot that leans towards it was opportunistic and these were just vulnerable people and it was, it was quote unquote easy to her. But if that's the case, why keep the trophies? There had to be some sort of gratification coming from it, you know? Why keep the things that weren't of value? I don't know. Yeah. It's very haunting. So, yeah, so that is, that's that. I, I think there's a lot of interest in this case. There's a lot of interest as far as gender goes. Juana Barraza is very, um, she's, she's more butch. She's more, you know, she, she's very, obviously having been a wrestler for a while, she was pretty like built. She had very close cropped hair. Um, she didn't present as extremely feminine. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a big element in the case as well. I think that made a lot of folks uncomfortable. And I think to Cervantes' point, some of the police outrage was actually due more to that, to the fact that, you know, you have this person who's sort of a little gender bendery, and then you have this like crazy extreme sentence, which I think is 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 warranted given the crimes. Yeah. But but I I think Cervantes' whole point is that her sentencing is seems to be based way more off of the fact that she, as a relatively like butch presenting woman, made people uncomfortable because it wasn't their typical image of a woman, and because you know they don't conceive of women 
the establishment doesn't conceive of women as being capable of that. But the reality is that all of us are. Absolutely. But thank you for that slice of true crime pie this week. We always appreciate a heaping dose of the mental anguish that you bring to the to the table. Absolutely. Happy to serve it out to you. Yes. And so while you are, you know, eating on that true crime pie, put some whipped cream on it. You can find us on all of our social medias for all of that extra content. The visuals on Instagram where you can find us at the Haunted Heart Podcast on Twitter. If you want to listen to some or see some of our short tweets that we got going on over there, fucking character limits, you can find us at the Haunted Heart. Or if you're a part of the Facebooks, you can find our page at the Haunted Heart Podcast, or we have a secret group that you can join that's private. So when you are approved by one of our Murder Mod Squad members, you can get in there and post all kinds of shit. And, you know, your fucking crazy Aunt Nancy won't judge you for it because she won't be able to see it. And we won't judge you for it because we're cool like that. Absolutely. And if you wish to support the show and get your own invocation, like you heard at the top of the episode, you can find us on Patreon at the Haunted Heart Podcast. We have tiers ranging from all the way from a dollar to whatever the fuck you want to give. We don't care, just as long as you're here to support the show. Absolutely. And I believe that that is it for all of the plugins for our social medias. So you know what you got to do, folks. Uh, until next week, when we come back with you, I guess it, uh, it's, it will be me. I'll come back with you with something else, something to bring us down. I'm sure. Oh, it'll be just you. It'll, it'll, oh, <laughs> I have the week off. It's just you're gonna it's do it. It's my week next week. Ah, uh, it'll we be my to, week. We need to call week. in digitally splice Katie. I need that bitch to work some hours. She wants to stay on the payroll. Don't bring her. Please do <laughs> not mention her name. Do not mention her name at all. Do not bring that upon us. She was us suspiciously for silent 20, in 2020. <laughs> Don't worry Wonder about what it. she was doing. Don't worry about it. Don't fear. But what you can do is you can stay, stay spooky. spooky.